Can you see it or you can't see it? Yeah, I can see. Yes. You can see the the um the slides, the yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, so I will start from the beginning. So oral and maxillofacial surgery. So again, you will find this on your Kindle, the learning objectives, okay? Okay. And what is oral maxillofacial surgery? It is the specialty of dentistry involving the diagnosis and surgical treatment of diseases, injuries, and defects. Indications. Indications mean why would we need extractions or why would we need to go and see the surgeon? Well, extractions of the decayed teeth cannot be restored, surgical removal of impacted teeth, extraction of non-vital teeth, pre-prosthetic surgery to smooth and contour the alveolar ridge. Believe it or not, sometimes people just don't need extractions. Sometimes their jaw is uh, got bones sticking out and we might have to take the bones out uh, sometimes we remove teeth for ortho, which is the braces, uh, root fragments, cysts and tumors we remove, and sometimes the oral surgeon does biopsy. He also does treatment of fractures of the mandible or the maxillary. He sometimes alter the size or shape of the facial bones. Sometimes he does the TMJ, which is the temporal mandibular joint, reconstructive surgery, cleft lip and cleft cleft palate repairs, salivary gland surgery, or surgical implant procedures. Now, a surgeon usually has to continue his education. All dentists are general dentists first, and then they decide what specialty they want, and then they continue from there. So if he wants to become an oral surgeon, then he has to go four to six years postgraduate training in a hospital residency. Some people even do it in the military. I know a lot of army that they go into the army and they learn surgery that way and then they become dentists when they finish. Now, the oral surgeon finishes a core surgical medical year before program completion with an emphasis on surgical techniques, anesthesiology, and oral medicine. So usually when they finish, they even have a medical license. So the surgeon must pass a national standardized examination of the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery as a requirement for practice. Do you see my slides moving? I just want to make sure. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. The surgical assistant, she must have or he have knowledge and skills in patient assessment and monitoring specialized instruments, surgical asepsis, surgical procedures, and pain and control techniques. So sometimes uh, after you finish the dental assisting program, if you want to be a surgical assistant, the doctor will do on-the-job training or he'll ask you to do continuing education courses, whatever he wants you to do uh, to become that surgical assistant. Now, the surgical setting sometimes is in an office, in a private office, or sometimes it's in a hospital or in an outpatient surgical suite. We have to understand the aseptic protocol. So if you think we're clean in the regular general dentistry, we have to even make sure that we are keeping everything sterile, okay? So we need to know the knowledge of needed supplies. We have to be familiar with the instruments. Uh, that's used in the procedures. We have to follow a routine for each patient. And every surgical procedure requires preparation and advanced planning by the dental team because everybody's surgery is different. An extraction is an extraction, but uh, to contour bone, that's a little bit different. So the procedures are, uh, the instruments and the procedures ha are handled a little bit differently. Advanced preparation. So we always have all the patient's records and radiographs in order. Those are your x-rays. We always have consent forms signed and available. We should never do any procedure without having patient consent. If we, have, uh, if we need information requested from their patient's physician, we have to have it, okay? So usually we only get that when the patient has uh, a lot of medical problems. We check for laboratory reports. We ensure that surgical setups have been prepared and sterilized. 
We provide preoperative instructions for any pre-medication. In the room, we have to make sure that the protective barriers are on, that the surgical instruments are sterile and wrapped. We don't open anything until the patient is in the chair, and that should be with all procedures because we always want to make sure that the patient knows that everything is clean. We can have everything on the tray, but when they sit down, that's when we start opening up everything. Have the appropriate pain control medication set out and ready. So uh, all the prescriptions are usually ready to give to the patient. Have the post-operative instructions ready to provide to the patient. We want to make sure we explain what's going to happen pre and post-op, what's expected after they have surgery and things like that. Patient preparation. So we always update the medical history and the laboratory uh, reports. We confirm with the patient that any prescribed pre-medication was taken as directed. So if we gave them any medicine before the appointment. We have to make sure that they took that medicine, okay? We make sure the x-rays are ready on a view box. We make uh, sure we take the vital signs for a baseline. We seat and drape the patient and we position the chair. Now, during the surgery, we have to maintain the chain of asepsis. We have to make sure we transfer and receive instruments. We provide aspiration and retraction as needed. We maintain a clear operating field with light. We monitor the patient's vital signs. We steady the patient's head and mandible if necessary. We observe the patient's condition and anticipate the surgeon's need. So a lot of times we have to be real careful. We know about the HVE, which is the high volume evacuator, but we also have the surgical one, okay? It's the smaller head and we usually use that one. So that way we're precisely in the area where the doctor needs us to be. When you come to lab, we will be taking out all these instruments that I'm about to discuss and we will have instrument identification with oral surgery also. Post-operative surgery, so at the end of the surgery, we have to stay with the patient. We have to make sure that we're giving them verbal and written instructions, that we schedule them their next visit, we update their records, we return the patient's records to the business assistant, so that's whoever's sitting in the front desk. And it's so important to make sure that we break down and disinfect the treatment area correctly, okay? Uh, we have to make sure there's no blood, there's no saliva, there's no nothing in that room. So sometimes we even have to clean that room double. Now in the mm -hmm. private practice, in addition to treatment areas, there will also be surgical suites that resemble operating room. Specific items used only for surgical procedures such as monitoring equipment, pain control units, mobile trays, replace items seen in a general practice. So that's not in all offices. What they're trying to say is in some offices, they have a special room just for uh, surgery. And usually that room has a closed door. So nobody hears anybody, any of the patients uh, moaning and groaning when they're doing their extractions. Is it in all the offices? No, but a lot of offices do have it. Now, if it's in an operating room of a hospital or ambulatory setting is quite different from a private practice, an application must be submitted to allow privileges at an institution and then the privileges granted based on knowledge, competency, and experience. So in other words, a, a oral surgeon dentist cannot just go to the hospital and be like, oh, I'm gonna do surgery here, it doesn't work that way. He has to have permission, he has to have his rooms, and um, you also have to have the permission because they're not going to let you into any oper oper operation room, okay? So that's something that the doctor will let you know, and he'll let you know how you can get into the hospital. You probably have to get an ID and all that stuff. Um, if, if you do go to the hospital, uh, usually the oral surgeon pays extra for that because now you're considered a traveling assistant. You go wherever he goes. I, whether he pays you for mileage or he pays you an extra dollar an hour, it, it, that's something that you discuss with the oral surgeon. 
Now their specialized instruments and accessories, it is critical for the surgical assistant to have a working knowledge and understanding of surgical instruments, especially if you're that, that traveling assistant that I mentioned. If you're that traveling assistant, guess what? You're the one who brings all the instruments with you. So you better know your instruments because if you're traveling to the hospital and you forget an instrument, they're not going to supply you with one. You have to bring your stuff. OK, so that's the difference there. All right, types of instruments and accessories. So when you come into lab, we're going to talk about the periosteal elevator. It retracts the periosteum for, from the bone. A straight elevator is used to apply leverage against the tooth to loosen it from the periodontal ligament and ease extraction. Root tip pick is removable, removal of root tips or fragments and forceps. There's many different shapes and designs. And again, when you come into uh, the lab, I will show you these instruments and we will label them just like this. So this is your periosteal elevator mm -hmm. and this is your straight elevator. These are your root tip picks and if you're looking at your kindle or your red shelf you're looking at these along with me these are just a few forceps there's many forceps again when you come to the lab i will show you the different forceps surgical curettes are used to clean and scrape the interior of the tooth socket to remove diseased tissue a rangeur is used to trim alveolar bone and a bone file is used to smooth rough margins of the alveolus after extraction. And this is what a curette looks like. To me, a curette almost looks like a spoon excavator. Okay, it has that rounded uh, edge on the bottom. A bone file looks just like a file, but it's in metal and it's stronger, of course, for a bone. We also have scalpels that we use. They're like nines to make pre precise incisions into soft tissue. We have hemostats, which are used to grasp and hold things. And we have needle holders that are used to firmly grasp a suture needle. So a hemostat, by the way, is used for many, many different things. And when I take it out, I'll show you. Here's your surgical handles and blades. Now, some of them, come like this number one, the green one, disposable. It comes all together. A lot of doctors are using this now that already the blade is on it. And um, once you finish with it, guess where it goes? In the sharps. Now this other kind, a lot of doctors also use it, the number two. This one is just the handle. And the reason why some of them like this one because they like to change the blades. If you look at number three and four, those are different uh, blades that get put on the handle. <coughs> Excuse me. And I will show you both kinds. Here's a hemostat. I love hemostats. Hemostats are like, again, I said they're used for many different procedures, not only for oral surgery procedures. Hemostats, they have this locking mechanism here and they have these serrated edges that's really good to grasp onto things. And again, that's why we like it. Needle holders almost look like uh, hemostats, except their beak is a little bit shorter. So for instance, if I go here and here, this is longer, the beak, as you can see, and this is shorter. So they almost look like the same thing, but the beaks is what you can tell. And again, when you come into lab, I will show you um, the difference between each one. Then we have surgical scissors are used to trim soft tissue. So, um, suture scissors are used to cut suture material and retractors are used to hold or retract tissue during surgery. We also have mouth props, which I've already showed you a mouth prop. That was that little black uh, rubber prop that you put in the mouth to keep them open, okay? It allows the patient to rest and relax the jaw muscles. Some people call them bite blocks. We have the chisel. It's either single bevel or bi bevel, and they're used to split teeth, okay? And a mallet looks like almost like a hammer, okay? A lot of doctors um, 
don't use the chisel and mallet too much anymore. They use the hand piece to cut or split the teeth, okay? Rotary instruments are used to remove bone or to cut or split the crowns or roots of teeth. So I will show you the, the specific burrs that are used for surgical. Again, surgical asepsis. Uh, because surgical procedures invade open tissue, the surgical team must follow sterile technique. A sepsis often refers to those practices used to promote or induce a sepsis in an operative field in surgery or medicine to prevent infection. So again, you know, in this case, we have to be even, I mean, we have to be clean in all our procedures, but we have to be even more sterile in oral surgery. Sterile field site where surgical instruments and accessory items are placed during the surgery. Surgical scrub. So if you think hand washing is, uh, you know, has to be accurate and correct, when you do scrub, you have to wash up to your elbow and you have to use a special brush. I also have that that I will show you and proper gloving um, also has to be done. Uh, so this is all part of a sepsis. Now those forceps that I show you that I said, there's many of them. They're used for um, if a tooth is fully erupted and has a solid intact crown that can be grasply firm, uh, grasped firmly with the forceps. So the forceps hold on to the tooth and pull it out of the socket. Uh, usually they're uh, used for simple or routine extractions. OK, we don't at this time uh, for simple or routine extractions, we don't use um, sutures. But when we're doing multiple extractions and alveoloplasty, so that means like when we're taking more than one tooth out or we're cutting the bone, we need a lot more stuff than just a simple or routine extraction. And again, I will show you in the lab, we're going to look at the different trays of what a simple extraction would be versus what is a more complicated one would be, okay? And when we do a lot of extractions, because we're taking so many teeth out, a lot of times at the same time we replace the teeth. But what that means is that the patient has to come in before we do any extractions and we start taking impressions of their mouth and we make their teeth. And on the day of extraction, we make sure that their teeth are ready. So as we take out teeth, we're giving them teeth. So that means they leave with a denture, whether it's a full denture or a partial denture. So there's different ways to do things, especially if we're going to be taking our front teeth. We don't want nobody to be walking around without any front teeth. So we want to make sure we give them back something on that same day. And a lot of people are very happy because they have a lot of broken teeth, um, rotten teeth or whatever the case may be. We take it all out and they leave with a nice denture and they're looking at themselves now granted they're in pain I mean they're numb at that point but they're like wow you know I have a really great smile so you you know I like to see surgery sometimes because you see them go from one minute of having all these bad teeth to the next minute having a beautiful smile granted that smile may have a lot of blood in it but you know once it heals it'll look a whole lot better now Removal of impacted teeth. Those are usually your wisdom teeth. A complex extraction of a tooth that has not erupted. There's soft tissue impaction, which indicates that the tooth is located under the gingival tissue. And we have hard tissue impaction, which means that the tooth is partially or totally covered by tissue and bone. And usually with that, when you do an impaction, um, you need more stuff than a routine or a simple extraction, and I will show you the tray for that also. Also, if you look in your Kindle in the procedures or on the back of the chapter or your red shelf on the back of your chapters, you will see the procedures and you will notice that simple or routine extraction only has, let's say, 10 instruments, but then you go into uh, other complicated things and they might have 20. So that's the difference there. They just have more than a simple. Now, biopsies, as I mentioned, the doctor will do a biopsy, surgical removal, and examination of lesions in the oral cavity. We have incisional or excisional biopsy or exfoliative cytology. 
And then once we do that, we have to get some biopsy results. Now, we want to make sure that what we're doing, the uh, especially like we're checking for different things. We're checking for cancer. We're checking, um, you know, uh, what what's wrong. That's why we're sending these biopsies so we could get the results. OK, what is malignancy? That's a growth that could spread to other areas. An incisional biopsy is performed on lesions larger than one centimeter. It's a wedge of lesion that is cut along with normal tissue. And exfoliated cytology is also known as a smear biopsy. We usually uh, take the lesion and brush and spread on a, on a slide, okay? Now, if we do an extraction, whether it's one or two or how many, and they need sutures, you want to make sure you have the sutures ready. Sutures are the stitches placed to control bleeding and promote healing. We have different kinds, absorbable or non-absorbable. The absorbable ones, those are plain, what's called cat gut, provides the fastest healing for mucous membranes and subcutaneous tissues. We have chronic cat gut provides a much slower healing, allowing the internal tissues to heal first. And we have visceral, that's a synthetic absorbable material. So I, when you come in, I will show you, I'll open up sutures and I'll show you the difference. Non-absorbable, those are usually silk. It's usually used for strength and ease of use. Polyester fiber is one of the strongest sutures. And we also use nylon for the strength and elasticity. Now, absorbable means that it will be absorbed by the body's tissue. It will dissolve. So that means that if we give absorbable, they don't have to come back for us to remove it. But non-absorbable means that they don't dissolve and they would have to come back so we can cut them, okay, and remove them for the patient. Normally, we tell the patient about seven to 10 days, five to seven, it all depends, okay, on which ones we use. So again, when non-absorbable uh, sutures are placed, the patient is scheduled to return to have them removed in approximately five to seven days. So before they leave the office, you will make sure that you make that next appointment for them and tell them, I'll see you in a week, five days, seven days, whatever it is. Listen says he knows better he'll say schedule them in a week a week is seven days schedule them in 10 days whatever he says you will schedule them now post-operative care control of bleeding when they leave we put a two by two inch piece of gauze that's folded and we place it in their mouth and we ask them to bite down on it that's to encourage clot formation and healing we tell them to keep the gauze in place for 30 minutes you know one of the reasons why patients don't heal so well, because they don't listen, okay? Or did we have an assistant give them the correct post-operative care instructions? So it could be two different things. So we really have to make sure we speak to the patient. I usually do the post-operative care before and after. So like when they're getting numb, I'm going over the post-operative care with them letting them know because at this point they're just getting numb they haven't had the extraction they're paying more attention to you and they can ask you questions at that time when they leave i just kind of reiter reiterate a couple of them if they come with somebody i also tell them the post-operative cares especially if they're going to be the one taking care of the person if it's a major surgery okay now if the bleeding doesn't stop you tell them to call the dental office that they should not disturb the clot with their tongue or by rinsing their mouth vigorously. They should uh, not do strenuous work or physical activity for that day, okay? So it's really important to remind them how to do it. I also tell the patients to, if, when they're gonna go and lay down to sleep with a pillow a little bit elevated, okay? So that way, if they are sleeping with their mouth open or is bleeding, they don't feel like they're choking type of thing. So you want to let them know that. I also tell them to put, if they're going to use their pillow, to put a plastic bag first over their pillow and then the pillowcase. Because if they do bleed out of their mouth and they're laying on their pillow, they don't want to ruin their pillow. You know, so I do usually tell them 
Uh, that's usually not on the instructions, but I know for a fact that those are things that can happen because I have my wisdom teeth. I laid down on my pillow and I drooled all over the place and I got a little bit of blood and a little bit of saliva on my pillow and I had to throw it away and get a new one. So if they love their pillow, they want to cover and make sure that they put something on their pillow. Okay. So um, again, we give them also uh, the, we're telling them the instructions. So we give it to them verbally and we also give it to them written. Okay. Now we tell them for control of swelling, ibuprofen is used before and after surgery. During the first 24 hours, a cold pack is placed in a cycle of 20 minutes on and 20 minutes off. After the first 24 hours, external heat is applied to the face. That helps increase circulation in the tissues and to promote healing. And after the first 24 hours, the patient may begin gently rinsing the oral cavity with warm saline solution. Okay, so sometimes we give them cold packs or sometimes we just tell them when they go home, you know, get some ice, put it in a plastic bag, a Ziploc bag is usually the best put it on and then the next day they can put little uh wet some towels put it in the microwave and put a little heat on their face okay that'll help with the swelling the diet the day of surgery the patient can drink liquids and eat nutritious foods making sure not to eat anything too hot or too cold the patient can begin eating solid foods the next day or as soon as he or she can chew comfortably try to chew on the opposite side opposite side of the surgical site if trouble by nausea and vomiting they can call the office and of course it's important to tell them not to have alcoholic beverages okay some people do all right and success in the early recovery period is very important for both the patient and the dental office team and the only way they can have success if they follow our post-operative care okay Post-surgical complications, so when they don't listen to us, okay, sometimes they get what's called alveolitis, which is a dry socket. This can occur for the following reasons, not caring for the extra extraction site as instructed, not following home care instructions, smoking, sneezing, coughing, spitting or drinking from a straw within the first 24 hours. So when we're explaining to our patient, don't do this, do this, do, these are the things that we should be telling them, don't smoke, be careful not to sneeze, cough, spit, drink from a straw, you know? And then women taking oral contraceptives are also more susceptible to a dry socket. Our post-surgical complications, this is continuation. So if they do have a dry socket, they have to come back to the office for treatment okay the doctor the surgeon will put what we uh, have a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory inflammatory drug if this does not relieve the pain the surgeon will prescribe a stronger medication the patient will be scheduled to come into the office for cleaning of the tooth socket and then filling the socket with a medicated gauze or a special paste to promote healing the patient will be instructed to return to the office daily for a dressing change until the socket starts to heal and the pain lessens. So we give them antibiotics before they usually leave and pain pills. And we tell them only take the pain pills as needed, but the antibiotics, they need to take it. If we give them seven days of antibiotics, they need to take it for the seven days. What do most people do? They take it for the first couple of days, they feel better, oh, let me save these antibiotics for the next time I need them. No, you take the antibiotics for the seven days. This is why most people don't heal correctly, okay? So you have to be really strict with your patient when it comes to this. And you have to let them know exactly what I said. No, if this is seven days, even if you're feeling better, please take the antibiotics for the full seven days. Now, the other thing that they don't do a lot when they go home, not that day, but the next day, they can start rinsing with warm salt water. Warm salt water helps any of the bacteria in the mouth, helps to soothe the tissues, helps to clean the area, and they should do it several times in a day. And a lot of times they don't either. 
So that's another thing that we have to make sure that they do. OK. Um, at this time, I will take any questions if anybody has any questions. Hey, okay, no. no questions? No. no. OK, let me just take attendance. I see Amanda and Andressa. OK, so um, you guys, uh, I think you submitted everything. I don't think I'm missing anything from either one of you, so that's good. Thank you for joining uh, me on this call, okay?